Mr. Kevin Johnson? Oh, Kevin man. Johnson. Absolutely. It's funny, Jonathan, Kevin, and myself, we all kind of started at the SANS Institute as instructors at the exact same time and kind of came up together and really look at these guys as, as kind of brothers in arms and that kind of weird cauldron of strangeness because it is weird <laughs> and it's all kind of people that you can talk to and be like, hey, this really strange thing happened to me with international flights. Is that the way it works for you? And it's like, yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin is hands down one of the smartest people I've ever met, but that wouldn't like be the reason why I'd bring him on here. One of the biggest reasons why I have Kevin on while I was hacking uh, this year is because there are very few people in this industry that have a firmer dedication to sharing knowledge with as many people as possible. Kevin's sole existence, you can tell from the time he wakes up in the morning to the time he goes to bed, is how can he share and get as many people up to speed in computer security as possible. He's, a, he's an amazing presenter brilliant technical mind and if you've had the opportunity to take a class from from him consider yourself very lucky and if you haven't then watch his classes whenever they come up at secureideas.com but today he's going to talk about the labors of hercules so kevin please take it away i don't know if i can live up to that that level of expectation that you've you've thrown out there and i'm very disappointed it won't turn on my webcam i have my sand trooper on a mannequin behind me it's awesome but you all are missing it so I, I, I'm going to try to live up to that. I, I, I will say that I am honored to be part of the speakers here at Wild West Hacking Fest. John has put together an amazing thing. I'm just upset that we stopped the old home week banter because this talk isn't going to be as much fun. So I, I, we're going to talk about the labors of Hercules. And I, John didn't mention this, but what I always try to do is come up with a talk that makes me laugh and has a reason why I think it should be. And I picked the Disney Hercules uh, movie because it's my oldest daughter's, one of her favorite movies. And I, I love her. She's awesome. I love all my kids, all three of them. It has been pointed out to me that I misspelled labors. I did not. I spelled it that way on purpose because it's the European spelling. And since we're talking about Hercules, I felt like it was important. I have to say that all graphics are copyright somebody other than me. I'm using Disney uh, things, which means we'll get a cease and desist or something. A little bit about me before I get really started. I am the CEO of Secure Ideas. That's the fancy way of saying head nerd. I'm an audience faculty member. I am a course author and instructor. And, and John is right about, I don't know if I'm as dedicated as he said I am, but I do believe that our purpose in life is to grow the next group of people to do what we want to do. And if we're not sharing our knowledge, we're dying. And I don't want to die. You can follow me on Twitter. I do a bunch of things. I open source fanatic. I'm, I'm the, one of the creators of Samurai WTF, PWAPT 101, which is a, a six-day web pen testing course that's completely open source and free. It's out on GitHub. I am also a, a dad. I've got three kids, two daughters and a son. That's me in the Vader costume and the clone trooper. I am a member of the 501st. That is actually the thing outside of my family that I am probably the proudest of. For the people who don't know, the 501st is a costuming group that raises money for charity. There's actually a number of security people that are members of it, which is kind of fun. We build screen accurate Star Wars costumes and then go visit kids in hospitals or raise money for charity. I believe the figure for 2019 was like $17 million worldwide raised, but I don't know. So that's what we do. My wife says it's the nerdiest thing ever. I pointed out that she met me when I was 26, so she doesn't know what was the nerdiest thing ever couple other things. One, I am full of tangents. I'm full of lots of things and my eyes are brown. And two, I have a sense of humor. Now, many of you may have misunderstood that and thought that I said that I had a good sense of humor. I did not. I said I have a sense of humor. To give you an idea, my current favorite joke, and it's been my current favorite joke for a while now, is why was Walmart not hacked? And the reason is they're not a target. <laughs> So I actually got to introduce like the CSO of Walmart or something. I don't remember what their position was. And I told that joke and they wouldn't shake my hand. So let's talk about why we're doing this. One of the main reasons is there is a gap and a cost to learning. And I'm not, I, I want to be very clear. We see all these headlines, right? The cybersecurity talent gap and all that kind of crud. 
I, I don't know how much I agree that there is a gap in hiring. I, I know it's hard to find people to hire. I know that it's hard to find people that fill the positions we have. But I, but I think that that's probably because we're looking in the wrong place. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the other problem is, and, and this is something that I have really harped about quite a bit, and that is the cost to become trained. And I'm not picking on any particular company here. As a matter of fact, the costs that I have on the screen were pulled from public websites, and they've gone up in all cases from the time that I took these screenshots, and they're all different companies. Like, this is not a I can poke fun at that company, whatever that company happens to be. This is really a problem with our industry. If you're starting out, and I can remember when I decided to stop being just an IT nerd and become a security nerd. Um, I started in IT in 1991, mainly by accident. I was a nerdy kid. A guy I knew was starting a company, and he needed a guy who knew how to develop and run a network and was cheap. I, well, I fit all those, <laughs> and so they hired me. And I got my first job right out of high school. So I, I always giggle when people say, well, when I got out of college, I, I don't know. I never went to college. I got a job. And then I stuck with it. So I kind of fell into this position of being an IT nerd. And I decided that security was interesting to me. And I wanted to get into it. And even then, it was expensive. But we're talking 20 years ago, right? I, was, I had to convince Denise to let me spend money on training and to let me go figure stuff out. And we made it work, luckily for us, right? But I look at it now, and, and, and now as a business owner, you know, I've got 19 employees, and they come to me and say, hey, I want a class. And I say, well, how much is the class? And they say, well, it's $6,000 or $7,000. And I'm like, what? I can't afford that. I, I And they can't. When we look at the training costs, and I'm not, I, I want to be very clear, if people want to spend that much, great, good for them. If people want to charge that much, if they think it's worth it, good for them. I'm a greedy capitalist. I'm perfectly willing to let people charge whatever they want to charge for whatever they want to offer. And if people are willing to pay it, good for them. But I think that we have a problem. And I think that the problem is that we aren't teaching enough people. We aren't reaching out to enough people to have these skills and get them to understand what they need to do. And then we also have a problem of what do we teach? I think that the biggest problem there is that people don't know the path. <laughs> and yes, that is an operating system pun, but I like it. <laughs> so we talk to people and, and as somebody, you know, John mentioned it earlier, I present all over the place. I teach all over the place. I'm constantly going out to customers' locations, and I'm, I'm, I'm the face of the company, which is really a bad choice because I'm funny looking. But we, we go out, and I am constantly being asked by people. I've got schools that say to me, how do we teach our kids? And, and they're like, well, I want to be you. I want to do what you do. How do I get there? And I think that a lot of people think that there's just this, I can wake up in the morning, I finished high school or I finished college, and I'm now a penetration tester. But they don't really know what they're doing. And they don't know how to get there and how to improve and where to focus. We see where it often, like, well, where do I practice? I, I want to learn this, but I don't know what to do. Or the number of times I've seen people say, like on Twitter, hey, just go join a bug bounty program and practice there. And I cringe. And that's not even a problem with bug bounties. Like I, we can talk about bug bounties offline or somewhere else if you want, but that's not even a, I don't like bug bounties. It's a, if you were a company offering a bug bounty, did you really want to get the people who don't know what they're doing and are practicing? No, that should not be our advice. We should be giving people who are learning practice areas and, and places to go to learn more and, and, whatever, right? On top of that, if you're the person learning or the person teaching, how do you know you're getting the correct information? I, I, I One of my favorite videos, and, and, and I'm going to be really boring, so you might as well go watch it now, but, but go out to YouTube and, and do a search for Next Gen Hacker 101. 
this kid, and I say kid, I don't know who this person is, and I and I, I and I want to be very clear. I'm not making fun of them, but this video is where they walk you through and show you how to see the IP addresses of everybody else that's visiting a website right now. And you watch this video, and the kid goes through this explanation of how to use, and I'm going to pronounce it the way he pronounced it, Tracer T, which many people on this webcast probably caught that. It's trace route. And this kid is doing a trace route from, from it sounds like a him, his machine to google.com. And every single one of the hops it takes, he claims is an IP address of somebody else visiting google.com right this second. And he starts describing, and he goes into this detail. And let's be very clear. It could be the ultimate troll. I don't know. But this kid has put a lot of thought and explanation into what he sees on the screen. And he talks about how the timing, right, the, the 15 millisecond, the whatever, that that is telling you how fast the person's speed, that they their internet connection is. And and he talks about how, you, you know, that that's their username and that, well, no, it's, host, right, like, it's just every bit of information in this video is wrong. Right, and and I'm a Star Wars fan, so you know it's 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 like Luke says, right? Everything you just said is wrong. But he was so positive and so sure of himself, and and I want to be clear, I admire that. Like I'm not, I'm following Tim's advice, right? I'm not blasting this kid. I'm just pointing out that we failed him because we didn't get him the correct information. And he doesn't know that, or, unless it's just an elaborate troll. But I know people who have watched his video and thought it was real, thought that was the right information. How do we verify this? And I'm not even going to get into Facebook and Russian trolls and fake news and all that kind of stuff, right? But if we can't even get the right information about politics, how do we expect to get the right information on technology out to people? And are we teaching ethics? And I know that's a touchy subject, subject for a lot of people, but are we teaching ethics? Are we teaching the right ethics? Are we teaching people when they should and shouldn't do what we do? Because let's be blunt, what I do for a living, day in and day out, is against the law, except for the fact that I have a contract, except for the fact that I have permission. And what does that mean, right? How do we, how do we know what we're allowed to do? I just had a conversation with a really, really good friend of mine, one of, one of my best friends yesterday, one, a guy I think is one of my best friends. And he asked me about a company that is just scanning the internet. And it talks about well, this problem and that. And, and Giovanni was like, hey, well, how, does, how do they get permission for this? And, and he was double checking because in his opinion, correctly so, they didn't have permission. So what they were doing wasn't ethical. And I, I happen to agree with that idea, so that's what I said to him. Like, yeah, no, that's, that's wrong. But here's a company who's offering a service of we scan random other sites and tell you about their vulnerabilities, right? And I'm not going to throw them under the bus, right, even though I'd like to. So how do we teach all this? So in my mind, what we have to build, what we need to focus is we have to stop thinking about information security as magic. We have to stop thinking about information security as this really high education. If you don't understand, you don't have a doctorate in computers, science, reverse encryption, quantum flux capacitors, whatever. What we really need to start thinking about this is that we're really just a trade. And I'm not trying to demean anything. I'm proud of being a tradesman. I'm proud of being somebody who is a, an internet plumber, right? And I think that we need to start thinking about things on a path just like a tradesperson does. And, and you know, the, the traditional, historic apprentice, journeyman, mentor. And, and please note that mentor is the last class. And there's two reasons. I, and I know many of you probably know the term master. I don't want to use that. And then there's two reasons I don't want to use it. And one, I think it's pretty obvious, 
there are negative connotations. Whether you agree with them or not, or you understand why people find them negative, they are there. And we have to recognize that. And in my opinion, just as importantly, well, maybe not just as importantly, but importantly, we also have to make sure that the person who has made it to that level understands that their job is to mentor everybody else. And honestly, all three levels should be mentored. Right? If you started out, you're entry level, you're an apprentice, and there is a set of things that you should learn and know how to do. And, and so when I look at, and as we'll talk about in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about building mentor programs and how to build this up and, and create these programs. But when I run a mentor program, I look at the people who are just coming in as apprentices. They're, they're entry level. They may know tons of stuff, and we may find out within a week of having them in the mentor program or a day of, or a minute of having them in the mentor program that really they should be a mentor themselves or they should be a journeyman or whatever, right? But, but the reality is when they start, we think of them as an apprentice. And the reason we think of them as an apprentice is because we want to hold them up to a set of skills a knowledge base, a knowledge level that they should have to start. And, and I really like pulling people into these programs from a variety of backgrounds. I like pulling people from help desks or pulling people from QA teams or even project management teams and non-technical teams to bring them in to these mentor programs, even if their goal is not to become a super badass pen tester, but so that they can understand. And so that they can grasp, because we want everybody to understand security, because security is everybody's responsibility, right? So we bring them in as an apprentice, and we start showing them stuff. We start working with them, and this is bi-directional. We want to take stuff from them, too. We want to learn from them, because let's be very clear, being a mentor is not the end. It really is just the beginning. So we start to talk and we start to discuss things and we start to teach them and show them and guide them. And that last part, I believe, is critical to understand. Our job is to guide, not direct. We don't force them down a path. We guide them where they need to go. We guide them where they can get the best knowledge and understanding. And then, as they're doing this for a while, as they learn, as they explore, as we support them, they become a journeyman. At this point, they're really competent. Maybe they're excellent at some things, but they at least have a level of competency. And what I like to think of is, I, using my company as the example, right, what we do is we consider somebody who's a journeyman, somebody who is ready to lead a project. They're not just a tester, but they actually are the ones that are interacting with the customer and, and kicking the project off and, and scoping projects and selling projects, right? They're, they're capable of, we know that they are good at what they do and they understand more than just somebody who's like, oh yeah, I know how to pen test. They know how to be a consultant. Now that's a secure ideas journeyman. In your organization, because you should be building these programs in your own organization, in your own groups, in your own whatever, uh, th that level of competency may mean a different description. And that's why I say it as vaguely as I can on the slide, but there's somebody who's competent at the job we're bringing them into. And then as they continue to grow, because mentoring doesn't stop. I think back and uh, you have these random thoughts, right? I think back to Richard Stallman's rider, if you bring him in to speak. And, and let's be very clear, uh, based on his rider, I've never met Richard Stallman, but based on his rider, he's a nut job. And I mean that as nicely as possible. But, you know, one of the things he wants, if you bring him in to speak, is a parrot. That, that he'd like to stay at somebody's house, and he hopes they have a parrot. But he, he says to them, don't go out and get a parrot. Because parrots can live like 70 years or something, right? They, they live very long periods of time. And, and like if I bought a parrot at my age and the parrot was young, because while it's not my birthday today, it was my birthday a few weeks ago and I turned 47. If a parrot can live 60 years, it is unlikely that I am going to outlive that parrot. <laughs> a parrot is a big responsibility. Being a mentor is a big responsibility. 
you're constantly working with them. So as they get to a point where they're a journeyman, as they've grown into a competent worker, right, your job now is to continue to guide them, to continue to provide that support and knowledge and understanding so that they can grow into being a mentor of their own, because that is our goal. As I said at the very beginning, as John used to describe me, which I still don't understand the accolades, but okay, I'll accept them today. But what our job is, is to get to that mentor capability, is to get to the ability to pass on the skills we have. Just recently, okay, a week before my birthday, I decided that I needed a hobby that didn't involve computers. Because I'm a nerd. I've been a nerd for so long that the guy who used to steal my lunch money still takes it on a regular basis. Damn, he makes a good Subway sandwich. But I decided I needed a hobby that didn't involve computers. And I've been fascinated by wood lathes, you know, where they turn the wood and they use the gouge to, to carve it into a shape, make cups or bowls or pens or tops or random shapes that fly all over the garage. Not that I know, speaking from experience. And I bought a lathe. But before I bought the lathe, that was my birthday gift. Before I bought the lathe, I started watching YouTube videos. And I started watching people who were sharing the craft, the art of wood turning. Just like we should be sharing the art of penetration testing or information security or IT or project management or whatever we do. And I was just struck by how much so many of these people in these videos just wanted to share what they were doing. One comes to mind immediately. Steve Ramsey was his name, and he's the woodworker for mere mortal. Woodworking for mere mortals is his channel, and I'm not pimping his channel. I mean, I, mean, I am. He's awesome. And, and he just wants to show you how to do woodworking. And there's other people that do the same thing, right? Like, here's how you do this turt lathe. And I, I, I was just so impressed by their passion of sharing, and I hope that, that people recognize my passion for sharing and that you should have the same passion. So let's talk about some of the rules. Now, Phil is the trainer in Hercules. See, there is a, a relevance to the Hercules reference. When Hercules needed to become Hercules, at least in the Disney movie, he needed a trainer, and he got Phil. I'm not going to try to pronounce Phil's real name, full name. And he has a set of rules. And let's be clear, in the movie he has like 100 rules or something. I've only pulled some of them as relevant to what we're talking about. Because most of the rules were jokes for the movie. And then I, I put some of these relevants here, right? And then I highlighted some of them and that I think are important. I think they're all important. We need to learn from our mistakes. But I think rule number one is probably very critical for us to understand. And that is is that everybody needs a hero or a mentor. Because in my mind, the hero is the mentor, right? That's what you become. You get to the point of you're a hero, and then you become the mentor. Everybody needs one. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. I am only where I am today because of the people who lifted me up. And I hope and pray and, and worry that I'm not lifting up enough people. That, that I want to be the shoulders somebody else is standing on. But we all need that hero, every single one of us. We also need to remember that we shouldn't get cocky. And I think that, that number 13 on here is the same thing, right? Don't stop for applause. We don't do this, or we shouldn't do this, for recognition of being smart for being the best, for being number one. I, I, I worry so often when I see people talk about things like, oh man, I wanna be an information security rock star. You know what, I don't wanna be an InfoSec rock star. I, I, I remember when I first started teaching for SANS, when I first released 542, it was a, a four day class. And Mike Poor used to joke, and tell me that I wasn't a rock star, I was a pop star, because I only had a four-day class. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing this for the applause. I've done some really, really neat things, and I don't mean that as in look at this cool stuff I've done. I've done things that I look at and go, man, that was fun. That was awesome. 
that was impressive to me. But I didn't do them because they were impressive. I did them because I needed to do them. I did them because I wanted to show somebody else. I present on a regular basis. I, I think I have five different presentations I'm giving in the next two weeks. I am absolutely petrified of public speaking. I don't vomit anymore before I do it. But I am petrified of public speaking. I hate it. I was nervous and upset all day with the idea that at 4.30 Eastern today, I had to join a green room to check my screen and my monitor and all that kind of stuff to make sure it was working. And then a half an hour after that, I was going to be presenting to all of you. I've been nauseous all day. I didn't sleep last night because it still scares me. And that's why I say I don't do it. So people can come up to me later and say, man, you did awesome or you sucked. I did it because I think it's important for us to share. Now, a couple other things to point out. One, play by the rules. If we don't follow the rules, then we're no better than the people we're trying to stop. We're no better than the people we're trying to protect against. So play by them. One of the things I like here is the greater your agility, the greater your ability. And I, I, I like that because way too often we get people who want to focus on one thing. I'm going to learn this one thing and I'm going to be amazing at it. But if you don't know all the things that support it, everything that is part of it, that you're not going to be as good as you need to be. And as you're trying to guide other people, you're going to have problems. And then finally, we need to aim. This is a hard one. I'm not a list person. I'm not a person who says, this is what I need to do, and here's all the steps that I'm going to follow. If you followed Tim's Twitter thread yesterday, I, I threw in an example of a story, and, and I sadly didn't make all of Tim's talks, so I don't know if he mentioned it, of when Matt Carpenter and I were doing a pen test. And Matt follows a process. Matt aims amazingly well. Matt Carpenter is a person that I am blessed to know, privileged to call friend. And he follows a process. And you know what? I don't. I should. And we did a pen test together. And I got root access to the system 10 minutes into the, the, the test. And it was funny because Matt complained to Ed, our boss, that he didn't think it was fair. I didn't follow the process. He was following the methodology, and I got root. And, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing and making it sound way more blah than it really was. The reality is that I got root in 10 minutes, but Matt did a better job. Matt produced better results. Matt produced a better test than I did. And it's the same thing when we try to teach other people. If I just stand up and say, I'm going to teach you information security, you're going to fail to learn it, and I'm going to fail to teach it. Because we haven't aimed correctly. We haven't realized what we need to get to. Now, having said that, you have to be a little careful, because when I started journey to become a security person. I actually built a list. I sat down and I wrote 10, I think it was 10 things that I needed to learn. And like I said in the previous presentation when I hijacked it, I wanted to be Mike Poor. I wanted to be like Mike. I, that's probably trademarked or something, right? And so I sat down and I wrote down 10 things that I believed I needed to learn to be Mike. And I focused on the first one and I learned it. And I crossed it off the list and I realized that I had a list of 23 things I needed to learn. Because when I was learning that one thing, I learned a bunch of other things I didn't know that I needed to know, but I still needed to know. And so I learned the next one, and I had a list of 75 things I needed to learn, and then 100, and then 1,000, and a million. And I'm now at the point where I have a list of 473 brilliant items that I need to learn. It's actually why... I believe that I'll never solve the imposter syndrome idea, and that's because I know how much I don't know, but I'm still aiming. And as we build out mentorship programs, we have to aim. So how do we build them? Because the reality is we need to build them to help everybody else and grow reams of people we need to secure us. And let's be very blunt. I don't mean all the people we need to hire to be security people. But if we don't teach as many people as possible what security means, and I don't mean user awareness, 
I mean, actually understanding security, actually understanding why security is important, actually understanding what security means. If we don't teach every single person we come into contact with, we're never going to solve this problem. And I know we're probably not going to solve the problem because it's just going to keep changing. But we can make it better. And to make it better, we have to mentor other people. Now, I want to be very clear. I don't like doing sales pitches. Okay, the only sales pitch I do in my talks, and I haven't done it yet, is that if you're a veteran or an active duty military person or a first responder, much of my training that I offer is free. Some of it's not. If it's not, it's hugely discounted as much as possible. There's my sales pitch. So if you are a veteran or meet that qualification, drop us an email and we'll send you the coupon code. That's my sales pitch. I have two examples of mentoring programs that Secure Ideas has built. I want to be very clear. Both of these programs are services Secure Ideas sells. I am not pimping them. I guess I am, right? I'm a greedy capitalist. Here's two mentor programs you can sign up for and pay me for. But what I want to show you is the implementation plan, and we're going to walk through it right now, of how Secure Ideas built these two programs so that you can build the same programs yourself. I want to give you enough information that you don't have to pay me, because I've talked about this many times. I joke and say that my goal as a business owner is to be protested by the Occupy movement. I'd like to be so stinking rich that there are pup tents in my cul-de-sac complaining about my lack of paying taxes or something like that, right? But the reality is, that my business goal is to go out of business. My business goal is to show people how to do it themselves so they don't have to hire me. They don't have to pay me. Now, the people who hold my mortgage are happy to know that that's probably not going to happen anytime soon, <laughs> and I'm going to continue to pay my mortgage. At least I hope so, right? But how do you build a mentor program yourself? Okay, there's a couple things you need to remember. One, you got to follow a series of guidelines. The first one is make the program formal. Now, I don't mean that we all wear tuxes. What I mean is that we actually have to formalize what the program means, what its goals are, and what is part of the program, what, what we plan on offering, how we plan on communicating it. And we need to communicate the plan, right? So it has to be formal. I've seen way too often. When I worked at Blue Cross of Florida, we tried to do mentoring and lunch and learns and stuff like that. And, and I'm not bashing Blue Cross. We, the people trying to do it, are who failed. And the reason we failed was it was kind of this, ah, we'll just do that when we can, right? How about we meet during lunch? When? I don't know. When are you available? Maybe next week. What do you think about Tuesday? Ooh, Tuesday's good. Oh, no, Tuesday's not good. Formalize it. Build out that process, that plan, that communication, and then let everybody know what it is. Here's what we're going to do. Like, for example, with SASTA, what we do is we tell people every two weeks there is going to be a live webcast that you can join. Here you go. Here's how you join it. Here's how this works. This is the schedule. And here are the topics it's going to cover. Do the same thing. Build out that entire process before you start. Don't don't go into it with the idea of, well, I'll see if people want to do it, and if they want to do it, we'll figure out what. No, don't do that. Be flexible, right? If you come up with a plan and you say, okay, every two weeks on Tuesday, we're going to do this, and then the people you're mentoring come back and say, oh, man, oh, Tuesday doesn't work, and here's why. Is there any way? No, 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 I formalized this. I, it's too, no, don't do that. Be prepared to flex but have the plan to flex from, okay? Because if you don't have the plan, you're going to fiddle fart around for a while. And that's what happened with us when we were trying to do the mentoring at Blue Cross, is we fiddle farted around. And then we realized it wasn't really working. And because it wasn't working, nobody had the interest to try to fix it. Okay? But that, that was the issue. And so make it formal. Then identify mentors. Now, I, this I say aggressively. I don't mean go beat people up, right? Pull a gun and run around shooting at people until they become a mentor. What I mean is, don't just put out, let's say you're doing this inside your company, 
inside your organization. Let's say you wanted to mentor people in the CISP, right? Don't just write out to people and say, hey, anybody interested in helping us teach other people how to prepare for this program? We actually see this a lot with development teams. Uh, security people realize that developers need to know more about security. And we want to build up security in our development lifecycle and, and what have you. And so what, what you'll see is a security team will reach out to the development managers or they'll send out an email to all the developers or groups of developers and they'll say, hey, anybody interested in becoming a security champion? Always love that term, security champion. Do I get a shield and a sword and a horse? No. And they send these emails out. Hey, anybody want to do this? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? And they don't get anybody. Or they get a couple people. Worse, they get people who there's no way that person is ready to be a mentor. Notice I didn't say they couldn't be a mentor. I said they're not ready to be a mentor. Go out aggressively and identify the people that you think can be mentors and drag them into this program. Obviously, you can't kidnap them, right? I mean, you can. It's illegal in most states. Go out and identify who you are going to have be the mentors to help out with this stuff. Bring them in and work with them on the plan. Work on them on the formalization of the program. Now, you should have the plan started at least, mostly done, by the time you bring the mentors into it. Because if you bring them into it and you say, look, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do this. They're gone. But bring them in and start working with them on adjusting the plan for the way the program works. Now, the next part is pretty complicated for a lot of people, but it's critical. You have to provide multiple paths for learning. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Jason Gillum, one of the owners here at Security, is a dude is a genius. He talks about as we were building our mentorship programs, how people learn differently. I don't know about you, but I like to read. I read a lot. I read every single day. I try to take in as much information as possible. I don't learn well by watching a video. I, I just don't. Now, having said that, I just released a whole bunch of videos this morning, but I don't learn that way but other people do. I was just talking to somebody, man, I don't remember who it was, and they were like, oh man, this is awesome. I watch these videos and it's so, it was Bill, one of my consultants, and he was watching the Professional Evil Fundamental videos that we released today, and, and he was like, man, this is great. This is a great way to learn. I, I understand things so much better when I watch it in a video, and now I'm happy to say he didn't learn anything from the fundamental videos I released today because he's above that. He's one of our senior consultants. He's one of our mentors. But he's like, I learn from videos. Other people, my oldest daughter, she likes to listen to audio books and audio podcasts and things like that. Listen, because that's how she can focus. There's nothing distracting. She just sits there and listens. Whereas my younger daughter, Sarah, she likes the videos. She likes to see things. She also likes to do hands-on. Doing the lathe, we've also been pouring resin to do these different, uh, we're nerding out at home with crafts, right? Uh, we have more glitter than anybody else should have. She watches a video on how to pour resin, but then she has to go do it. And until she does it, until she actually sits down with the total boat and combines the hardener with the, the resin and stirs it up with the, the, the powdered coloring and then pour it into the mold and wait for its whole time, and I'm probably using terms that don't matter in this context, but you know the resin that we're using has a pot time and then a cure time. And Dara read it in the directions, and she's 13, right? So she read the directions. Then she watched a video, Evan and Caitlin. It's the video series that she and I like to watch together. And they were talking about it, and they were pouring it, and Sarah kind of understood it. But it wasn't until we sat down with the actual resin and poured it and stirred it and watched it start to harden as we were stirring it, that she started to understand pot time, like how long until you can't pour it into a mold anymore. And then the resin we were using is a slow hardening resin, and so it takes two days to completely cure. And so about three hours later, it's able to be removed from the mold if you want to, this particular resin. Don't, don't take this as advice on how to do resin. 
and we pulled it out of the mold because we were impatient, right? Ah! But you could still tell that it wasn't completely cured. And it wasn't until she held it in her hand and did it that she really understood the difference between pot time and cure time and what that meant in doing this process. And I find that quite often with people learning how to pen test. Until you dump a database, do you really understand SQL injection? Until you change the price on a website, do you really understand logic flaws? So there's multiple paths that you have to take into account in your mentoring. And then you also want to think about different communication paths. That's part of that path to learning, right? And what we like to do is, you know, you've got some books or written materials, slides. You've got recordings of audio and vi video teaching you how to kind of do stuff. And then you have, I say chat rooms, right? But like we run Slack workspaces where you can sit in the Slack workspace and talk to other students and mentor mentees, I guess is the right word. And like for us, we actually have our consultants idling in those Slack workspaces so that they can be there at any time to answer questions, right? And when we actually have a, an SLA that, you know, within half an hour, you'll get a response during business hours to a question in the SASTA channel. And, and I point that out, that, that you should be doing the same thing. You should give people, this is part of making it formal, jumping back, you give them an SLA, an expectation of how fast they'll get a response, how fast they will be able to talk to somebody. And, and you also need to have them understand that the people being mentored have a level of expectation because there's nothing more frustrating than reaching out to somebody and asking a question because they're your mentor. And, 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 and let's be clear, it's, they're busy, right? They have jobs, they have lives, they have families, whatever, they have hobbies. But you ask a question, and it doesn't matter how unimportant that question may seem to somebody else. To you, it's critical. To your mentee, or whatever that word is, right, it's critical. They have to have something. So having an expectation of response is important in your program. And communicating that expectation so that people know. And I'll, and I'll pick on Sasta, right? I don't know about you, but I have no work-life balance. And so it is very often that at two in the morning, I'm sitting on my computer working, hence the reason I needed a wood lathe, and somebody will throw a question into the Sasta channels, and I'll answer it because I'm sitting there. But we try to make it very clear that if they get that answer at two in the morning, that's a one-off. We're trying to help because we're there, but, but the expectation is that they'll, we'll be there during business hours. We'll be working with them at that time. And then finally, as you build out this program, you have to ensure that people are engaged. That's a typo, it should say engaged. Reach out to the people that are in the program, all of the people in the program, the people attending, the people mentoring, the people, and, and this should be a group thing, but make sure that you reach out to people and, and are you understanding, are you following, are you doing this, are you, like we, we give assignments. Like if you go through our CIS mentorship program, you get an assignment every single week of stuff that you're supposed to read and quizzes you're supposed to take and practice exams that you should be following up on. And we reach out to students and attendees and mentees, whatever you want to call them. Hey, are you reading it? Are you getting this? Are you following this? Is this making sense? And we try to engage them. And there's a number of reasons for that. One, it's important because people will feel like, ah, I don't want to bother them. No, bother us. Let me manage my own time. People also, they get stuck. And a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I've done it, right? Where I've, I've gotten stuck on something. And the next thing I realize is it's been three days and I haven't solved my problem. And it's because I was stuck. But if my mentor had reached out in that three-day period and said, Kevin, how you do? I would have immediately said, oh, I'm having a problem with this. The other thing that you need to make sure that when you reach out to them is that you are accepting feedback and paying attention to the subtle, unspoken feedback of how well you are mentoring. Because if you reach out to one of your mentors, one of the people you're mentoring, I mean, and they comment that they haven't heard from you in a couple of weeks, they're not trying to be mean. It's just like, hey, man, it's great to hear from you. I didn't hear from you in a couple of weeks. You're failing. You've messed up in your program. You need to make sure that you're paying attention. And if they ask you a question, one of the things I hear, I'll, I'll explain something. I'm mentoring students, whatever, 
you hear this, you'll say, hey, okay, this, they'll ask you a question, you'll explain the question, and, and how often do you hear a, an instructor say, make sense, you got it, does that work? You, yeah, you, yeah, you, you with me? And the only right answer there is yes, of course I got it. Now that's not true, that's not the only right answer, but as the person mentoring, as the instructor, what you need to listen for is the person going, yeah, 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 it's okay, I got it. No, you probably don't. Let's talk a little bit more. You don't want to bother me. You feel dumb. We all feel dumb. I can't tell, tell you the number of times. I've had somebody teaching me something, and I've just not gotten it. And I felt stupid asking them to repeat it again and again and again. As the mentor, if you engage people, if you reach out to them, you'll know they're having that problem. That's our goal. And like I said, Secure Ideas, we've implemented two programs of mentorship that we believe are very successful. The feedback we've gotten from people are very successful. We're building more. And I'm not saying that like, oh, hey, look at these great programs, buy them. Please, look at these great programs, buy them. It's the way I make payroll. But you can build them yourself. Our entire responsibility is to be like Phil. And I don't mean gruff and a drunk. I mean mentoring the next series of heroes, being the shoulders people can stand on. Thank you. And now I'll open it up to questions. I am not in, I just realized I'm not in the Discord channel. So I'm going to let whoever is the person in the Discord channel repeat the questions to me. Oh, that would be <laughs> The problem is we get all of these different things that pop up. I've got a question for you. Okay. Um, this is from, I'm going to just call him Swagner because that sounds cooler. I spent the better part of the past two years establishing a club in my college that provides a lab environment to learn blue and red team options. Any tips or resources for building an introductory mentorship program? Most of the time, we have new members come in and tend to get overwhelmed with the concepts or more seasoned members are engaging. So I think it's like that wave thing where the people that are at the earlier part, they get yep. in, they start doing amazing stuff, and then people that come in get a little bit intimidated. Yeah, so there's two things I'd recommend doing it. One, and we just started it this morning, we released our Professionally Evil Fundamentals, and it's a YouTube playlist, as dumb as that is, and they are two to four minute videos that are just definition. And we're, we're, we've got like 21 of them recorded now, and they're being published two at a time, three at a time over the next few weeks. But, but the goal there is, and you can do the same thing, is start documenting and recording, whether it's a video or just writing it down, that introductory stuff, so that as somebody comes in, they've got a place they can go to get it. That's, that's the first recommendation. The way John described it, it's right. You have these waves of people that come in, and, and they come in, and then two weeks later, there's a new group, but the old group is still pushing forward. The second recommendation, and, and I'm going to pick on my CISP mentorship program because it's how we do that. If you were to sign up and, and feel like I'm sales pitching and I'm not, if you were to sign up for the CISP mentor program, it's a nine-week program. It has a definite calendar. It has a start and a stop. And you pay for it. Paying for it that one time, you then get to take the mentorship program as many times as you want. Because our goal with all mentoring is not just to prep somebody for that test, but to prep people for understanding of the knowledge, right, and, and learning. And so what we do, and we've actually seen it, it's been beautiful in the CIS program is that what you have is we have a nine-week program. People take it. They learn. They engage. They talk. They build relationships, and they finish the mentor program. And then we take about a month. We do it a month because we're billable consultants. And then we launch another mentor program. <laughs> and everybody who is in the other one can sign up for the new one. And then we have new students come in. And what we find is that, one, the experienced mentees, I don't, I don't know if that's really the word, but they start exploring more, we start getting more complicated discussions going and deeper dives into the theoretical and this and that, which is awesome, right, and fun, and also probably overwhelming to the new people. But the new people are being presented the stuff in that same calendar moving forward. They, there's that program and everything else. And, the, but they're also getting exposed to the, the more advanced stuff. But what I'm seeing, and this is the beautiful part in my mind, we're seeing the people who have taken the mentor program before becoming mentors themselves. They're helping people. They're answering the questions. They're guiding people through things. It's gorgeous. And, and, and so that, 
to me is the way to do it is to have a time frame per program. But too often I see these, these hey, here's a, a lab environment you can play in and everybody gets to, it's free form and there is no, this is the start, here's the end. And that leads to that, oh man, people are so far ahead of me that I'll never catch up, I might as well stop. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think that answered it. Also, another question that came in that I thought was interesting was, I'm a college student in a cybersecurity program in school. Do I need a mentor? I don't have a clue about cybersecurity. I'm an accomplished student, and I've worked with computers all my life. I, I'll take a crack, yes, but you don't necessarily have to go and find someone and say, will you be my mentor? Because there's lots of people like Kevin, like BHIS, we do webcasts all the time. Mm-hmm. There's a tremendous number of people that are constantly giving back to the community that you can basically be hooked into their program. You can start seeing the webcasts, going through their training, hack yes. the box, all of these different things. That, that, that would be my recommendation. Kevin? I agree with your recommendation. The only addition I would do is I do actually recommend getting a local mentor as well. And, and the reason is, and, and in my opinion, it shouldn't be one person. What you should do is try to engage in local groups. Everybody needs mentors. You're going to need mentors your entire life. No matter what you do, there's going to be something else you need to learn, and there's going to be somebody who knows it better than you. I will tell you that Black Hills is an organization I I immensely admire. The John said at the beginning of how my passion is to share. So is this John's, right? And they are constantly putting stuff out there. Get engaged follow people on Twitter, join the conversations, get in Slack channels, and ignore the noise. Uh, I've seen way too many people who will jump into these things, and they'll they'll throw out a question to somebody who is, quote-unquote, awesome at this stuff, and they'll get a rude answer back. What I have found is everybody who gives an asshole answer to something is probably not that good at what they say they can do. The people I know that are actually good at stuff want to share it. Well, and, and I also think the, the noise, there's, there's places like that are fine for noise. It's like Twitter is there for politics and noise and um, <laughs> social justice, argue out, argue out things. But don't for a second think that Twitter is what the information security community is, and that's all that it is. You can go to LinkedIn where it's professional, and it's a little bit, uh, almost a little bit stifling from time to time, but don't think that that's what it is. You almost got to hit multiple places and spread out and take the good and ignore the yeah. bad. Unless I will also hand. say, find those if, local if somebody, groups. I was going to say, if somebody on Twitter basically says you shouldn't wash your hands for whatever reason, you feel safe to ignore those people. Oh, and Nazis. Ignore Nazis. But see, I disagree. I don't think we should ignore Nazis. I think we should punch them in the throat. Oh, crap. That's right. Remember, our parents always said violence is never okay, unless Nazis. I mean, even my mom. I would play Wolfenstein, and she's like, that's a violent game. And I'm like, Mom, it's not. She's like, okay, it's cool. Kill him. <laughs> well, one final question before you go. I'm not going to say who this is from, but who's your favorite employee? Who's my favorite employee? <laughs> Let's be very clear. My wife is an employee of the company. That is the only right answer. 